Welcome to the Grow My Salon Business podcast, where we focus on the business side of hairdressing. I'm your host, Anthony Whitaker, and I'll be talking to thought leaders in the hairdressing industry, discussing insightful, provocative, and inspiring ideas that matter. So get ready to learn, get ready to be challenged, get ready to be inspired, and most importantly, get ready to grow your salon business. Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Grow My Salon Business Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Whitaker, and as always, it's great to have you here with us today. Thank you for the compliments regarding the podcast. I really appreciate it. And if you're one of those people who haven't yet left us a review for the podcast, I would love it if you did. Ratings and reviews are extremely helpful. They do matter in the rankings of the show, and it helps other people to find the podcast. I also love to hear what's been helpful. All you need to do to leave us a review is go to the Apple Podcast app, search Grow My Salon Business, scroll to the bottom of the page and leave a review and you would make us very happy. So with that said, on with today's show. I got an email recently from a regular listener to the podcast who has a couple of barber shops and in his words, this is what he said. We are rebranding after 11 years in business to keep with the times and install some energy into the team. That being said, I'm coming up with lots of difficulties and I need some advice. So that's all I have to go on, but it's more than enough to address a problem that only fortunate or lucky salon owners need to address. Now, I say fortunate or lucky because he's been in business for 11 years so far, so he's obviously done a lot right. Because most salons, most barber shops, and in fact, most small businesses don't last 10 years. So the fact that he has is cause to celebrate. But for whatever the reason, and we'll dig into that in a moment, he recognises the old adage that what got you here won't get you there. Meaning that All businesses need to constantly evolve and reinvent if they are to survive and remain relevant and hopefully to grow. It reminds me of a famous quote from Bill Gates, who's the co-founder of Microsoft, who once said, in three years, every product my company makes will be obsolete. The only question is whether we will make them obsolete or somebody else will. Meaning that change isn't a choice. Change is inevitable, and if you don't change in business, you will die. It's just a matter of how long it takes. So back to the email I got where he said, we are rebranding after 11 years in business to keep with the times and install some energy into the team. That being said, I'm coming up with lots of difficulties and need some advice. So the first thing I try and do is to identify what the real problem is, meaning What was the trigger or the catalyst for all of a sudden wanting to, in his words, rebrand to keep up with the times, install some energy into the team? Maybe there wasn't a trigger that set him on this path. Maybe he's been thinking about it for a while and recognised that the shops were looking a bit tired and dated and needed a refresh. But maybe there was a trigger. For example, Have some staff left? Has a competitor opened up next door or next door but one? Have his sales stagnated? And have all his costs increased and so is he no longer profitable? So it's really important to understand what the thinking is behind why he is wanting to rebrand so that you can focus on what the real problem is before you come up with solutions. Because maybe a rebrand, in whatever that entails, and we'll come to that in a minute, isn't the solution to what the actual problem is. So for me, that's the first step, to get really clear on what the real problem is that you're trying to solve. So let's get back to that word rebrand, because he said he wants to rebrand after 11 years in business. Now, branding can mean many things to different people. Rebrand implies that this owner feels that the business has slipped and it needs an overhaul. So I'm going to ask myself, what does he mean by rebrand? Because, well, for some people, the word brand or branding is just about the visual elements. But branding goes a lot deeper than that and addresses the invisible elements that make the business work. And I group all those things under the term culture. And that includes 
how the clients and the team interact, the experience they have, the relationships that are built. So branding for a barbershop or a salon involves creating a unique identity and an image for the business that reflects its values, the style and the services that it offers. And it encompasses everything from the logo and the color scheme to the atmosphere and the experience that clients have, all aimed at making the barbershop memorable and recognizable to clients. So when he says that he wants to rebrand, does that mean he wants to change the name, the logo, the color of the walls and the decor? Does it mean he wants a new website with a clearer messaging in order to attract the clients and the team that he wants? Does he want to take it more upmarket and offer a more premium price service? Or does he want to take it to being a more value or budget brand at a lower price point? Now, just to be clear, there's nothing wrong with doing any of those things if it's for the right reasons. But you could spend a lot of money in the process of doing those things and not be addressing what the real problem is. Many hairdressers have a creative side to them. But when they start out in business, they also usually have a very small budget for branding. And they usually already have a look and a feel that they want to project in terms of the salon's decor and for all of their marketing. Sometimes they get it absolutely right. And with a little help from a graphic designer and maybe a website developer, they have something that they feel proud of and that works for them. Other times, your initial attempt at branding might be enough to get you up and running, but you recognize it's temporary and that you need to invest some money into getting the right creative professionals, whether that's interior designers or graphic designers or branding or marketing agencies, to really pull it all together for you. Now that can cost a lot of money, but if you work with people who really know what they're doing, it can also give you a more successful business and pay back the investment many times over. So a rebrand can be good if it's done the right way and for the right reasons. It can breathe new life into the business, the clients, and for those who work there. It can attract more team members and it can enable you to increase prices and to grow. But, and there's always a but, because a radical rebrand can also confuse people, whether that's staff or clients, because some of them might like it just the way that it is. And so you need to recognize that if it's a radical rebrand that you're doing, you will potentially attract new clients and staff, but in all likelihood, you will also lose some existing clients and staff because, well, they like it the way that it was and they don't like the change. But remember, potentially losing some staff and clients isn't always a bad thing. In fact, it can be healthy for a business to get old ways of thinking and working out and to get new ways of thinking and working in. As a business owner, you need to do what is right for the business. And in most cases, that will also be what is right for the team and the clients. But there is an inevitability that some people will resist change. But we'll come to that in a minute. Over the years, I've been lucky enough to work with some branding experts, and what I've learned is that if you invest in the right people, they will spend a lot of time to understand you, your clients, and how your business operates and how it's positioned in the market before they produce any creative suggestions. Whereas the wrong people will try and pigeonhole you into their version of what they think your brand should look and feel like. Now, the gentleman who sent me this short email didn't know I was going to forensically break it down word by word and sentence by sentence and read into it the way that I are. And so maybe I'm drawing some wrong conclusions. But the next thing he said was that his reason for rebranding was to keep up with the times. So again, he may mean that in the context of when it comes to using technology that he's fallen behind. Or he may mean that in the context of when it comes to communication with clients and even potential team members, that he isn't utilising social media in the way that he should. Or he may mean that in the context of the look of the place is outdated and it needs an overhaul. Or he may mean that the culture that exists in the business may have been relevant 11 years ago when he opened but the expectations of people today are very different to what they were in 2015. 
But whatever it is, the problem he is hoping to fix is at the end of the sentence, where he says, and to install some energy into the team. I think that's the problem that he's hoping a rebrand will fix. But what does he mean by install some energy into the team? What does that look like? What's happening at the moment? Does it mean that at present they look sloppy? Maybe they're lazy. Maybe they just sat there in the chair reading a magazine in the hope that a client walks in, which is an absolute turnoff for any potential client. Maybe they don't have pride in where they work. Maybe they've lost their passion for the craft. Maybe they make absolutely no attempt to give clients a great experience that goes above and beyond. Maybe they make no attempt to build relationships with new clients, no attempt to introduce themselves and to use the client's names, no attempt to educate and inspire and rebook them. Because if that's the issue, then a fresh coat of paint, a new logo and a fancy website isn't going to solve the problem. And that leads us perfectly into the last sentence of his email, where he said, I'm coming up with lots of difficulties and need some advice. Now, I suspect that the real challenges he is facing are in that last statement. So what are the difficulties that he's up against? Well, he didn't say, but I'll assume that regardless of what I've said up until this point, that the biggest problem that he is having is that his team are resisting the changes that he wants to put in place in his business. Now, it may not be the team. It may be something completely different, but I'm going to assume that his biggest problem is resistance to change from the people on his team. Now, you and I don't know what those changes are. It could be changes to opening hours. It could be changes to appointment times. It could be changes to pricing or the range of products or services that are offered. It could be changes to how the productivity of the barbers are measured. Perhaps he wants to start measuring and rewarding rebooking or retail or client retention. Who knows, he might just want to change the brand of coffee that they offer clients. But the point is, let's assume it's his business. It's his name on the list. It's his responsibility. And so he has to make decisions and make sure that those decisions are implemented and followed through by everyone on the team for what he perceives is for the good of the business. Now, this doesn't mean that he has to be a tyrant and just bulldoze his ideas through without consultation and involvement from those on his team, because that may work in the short term, but it's probably not going to work in the long term. So what should he do? Well, the first thing he should do is to recognize that for many people, they see any change as meaning that this won't be good for me. They might assume, what am I going to lose or what's going to be taken away from me? So if he's smart and a good leader, he will know that the best way to get change through is to get his team on side. So he should sit them down as a group and have a discussion about the business and get their input on what they feel is working and what's not working. Make them feel heard. Listen to their ideas and opinions and involve them as a team in the process of change. They will have some ideas that perhaps you haven't considered that could be implemented. But equally, it's not their business And it's not their financial responsibility. So when they think of ideas for the business, they're not thinking of them in the context of, is this financially viable for the business? As the owner and leader, that's your job. And decision making is your responsibility. You can listen, you can reflect, you can compromise. But ultimately, you have to decide what is best for the business. I always think that now more than ever that one of the foundational values in your business should be that you are evolving and that the business is constantly changing to suit the needs of the economy, the clients, the team and the business. Change can't be a surprise. It needs to be a constant and never-ending process. In fact, the Japanese have a word for it called Kaizen, K-A-I-Z-E-N which translates to change for the better or continuous improvement. Some people will always grumble about changes, but given a little time, they'll accept them and they'll get used to them. Obviously, you don't want to lose good people from your team, but 
No one is indispensable. And you have to put the needs of the business before the needs of any single individual on the team. Some people, whether they're clients or team, won't like the changes. So as harsh as it sounds, you need to accept that not everyone will share your journey forever. And if they're employees and they're preventing or holding you back from changing your business, then you need to look for ways to legally move them on. Now, as I said earlier, ultimately, what is good for the business, you want to be good for the individuals within the business, but your responsibility as the owner is to put what is right for the business first. So before we wrap up this episode, perhaps a key takeaway is that many people sort of work on the principle that if it's not broke, don't fix it. But the problem with that is that one day they wake up and realize that some big changes need to happen. And it's the big changes that upset the apple cart. Now, I'm certainly not against big changes, but I am very much for constantly evolving your business so that change becomes expected and accepted. So with that said, we need to start winding this episode up. But before we do, we are in the process of relaunching our online management program where we go into a lot more about building your business from the ground up and creating the business and the culture that you want. If you want to find out more, then visit us at growmysalonbusiness.com or on Instagram at growmysalonbusiness. And I'll put those links in the show notes for today's podcast on our website. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating and review on the Apple Podcast app. So to wrap up, thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Grow My Salon Business Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you'd like to connect with us, you'll find us at growmysalonbusiness.com or on Facebook and Instagram at growmysalonbusiness. And if you enjoyed tuning into our podcast, make sure that you subscribe, like, and share it with your friends. Until next time, this is Anthony Whitaker wishing you continued success.